are challenges of democratic transition in the post-revolution MENA region. Mr. Khanfar, Thank you very much. Good morning. Assalamu alaikum. I would like actually to start the debate about the issue of transformation by referring to the current situation in Cairo. Then later on we'll go back into defining the roots of the current scene that we are witnessing at this stage. I have been in Cairo during the last few years, a few days, and have been trying to get a proper understanding of the transformation uh, or the moment that we witness right now in Turkey, and sorry, in, uh, uh, in Egypt. And I feel that during the last maybe few months, we have been going through consistent transformation towards demor democratization. There are many troubles. There are many issues related to polarization, to competition, and to many other facts. But during the last 10 days in particular, what we have seen is a departure from the norm of the transformation. It is not indeed something related to progress towards democracy. It has to do with each party trying to eradicate and to wage a crusade against the other, departing from normal political rivalry or competition. What we see at this stage in Egypt is not indeed something that could be related to political process of transformation. It has to do with some kind of instinct within two major camps that are competing amongst themselves. Each one of them has his own narrative, has his own thought of how things should happen and how he should proceed about it. Polarization has reached a level which we have never witnessed during the last few months since the collapse of the regime of Hosni Mubarak. Not only polarization, but also the process itself is in fact not designed to score political gain. It is designed in order to cancel or to delete the presence of the other. So it is becoming like existential war rather than a political competition or political debate in a society going through transformation. Now, why did we reach to this point at this stage? In my opinion, the story should not be discussed within the limitations of two years of transformation. It is not because we have a regime that has collapsed and we are now trying to build a state and therefore what we are seeing at this stage is something ordinary or normal. What we have seen during the last maybe one year and nine months is, is normal because any society going through transformation has to experience turbulence. There is nothing called peaceful transformation. There is nothing called happy change. Normally change brings with it something like what we have seen all over the Arab world during the last few months in Tunisia, in Libya, in Yemen, and in Egypt. But the last 10 days were actually different. The last 10 days were a result of very complicated political, psychological, social, and religious components within the society in Egypt and within the fabric of the societies in the region itself, by large. This region, in order to understand it, as you may know, this region has been trying to develop its own identity politically and culturally and religiously during the last one century. And during this century, we have been living in complete dualism, a departure from the organic, normal, and natural progress of any society. Because any society, it has components that form its identity, it forms its collective memory, it forms its belonging and vision about itself and the future. 
In the case of our societies, and since the First World War until today, we have been going through transformation. And this transformation has alienated the natural growth and progress of our societies from the political process and from the strategic relationships in the region, in a way. The state itself in the Arab world has never gained proper legitimacy for almost one century now, because it was created as a result of colonial intervention in our countries after the collapse of the Ottoman Empire and the vacuum that was created in the region. So the borders, the style of governance, and the formation of geopolitical uh, balance in the region was not a, a result of natural process. The boundaries are artificial. The culture of ruling has been, in fact, infused in the region by the British and the French colonialism in alliance with tribal and traditional forces in order to preserve foreign interests rather than to create in the region something that we could describe as our, our own view about ourselves ab and about our future. S borders literally were drawn by someone like Mr. Churchill, who was at that time the secretary of, col of, colonial, uh, of colonialism outside of the colonial, uh, British colonialism outside uh, Britain. And last day, uh, yesterday I was reading a book about Jordan, and Churchill used always to be proud to say that Jordan was drawn by me after lunch. You know, after they finished the lunch, quickly, before he took a nap, he was able to draw the borders of Jordan. This is what he used to joke about. It is true. This is exactly how the borders of the Arab world were drawn, by people who lack experience, by people who did have vested interest of creating some kind of colonial boundaries to preserve their own interest without any knowledge about the social and the demographic and the history of the region. Now, what does that mean? That means that we have been going through what I call now at this stage a psychological and political dualism. Psychologically, our nations have been always living with their own imagination about their culture, their religion, the pride of the past, and also about their own understanding of what the world should look like. So we have been brought up in the region where we really appreciate the past. The past was glorious. The past was magnificent. We did conquer China. We did you know, create a lot of great ge geographic, scientific, political and philosophical achievements to the world, and we are fantastic as far as the bus is concerned. All of us were trying to evade talking about the present, because the present, we could not classify it. In which slot we can put that present? Can we put this present within the spectrum of progress within our societies? It was not. So it, we had created a gap in our minds about our present. We could not reconcile our present with the continuous progress and natural progress of our civilization and culture for 1,400 years. So there was a gap, there was a vacuum. This vacuum was filled by something else rather than the continuous <coughs> approach towards history. It was filled not only by vacuum, by some kind of a dualism. So in one way, psychologically and philosophically, we are connected to a notion of unity and to a notion of a glorious past and to a notion of magnificent achievement. And on the other hand, as well, we are connected to very low profile, pragmatic, realistic, and fragmented reality that we thought in order to survive today and tomorrow, our presidents, kings and emirs, and whoever has been in charge for the last 100 days in the region, they were trying to actually just get through the moment in order to achieve a particular gain. So, someone ruling any country in the Arab world during the last 100 years, deep down might be in his mind, he would really subscribe to the notion of the one ummah, the nation, the Arab nation, subscribe to the glorious history, subscribe to whatever ideas he has in mind. But in practice, he will never dare to express his thoughts and ideas in reality.
because he would like to survive the next you know, year or the next month or the next uh, phase of his budget or his relationship with his neighbors and so on and so forth. So there was a complete duality, dualism within this 100 years. We have one perception about ourselves and the world, and we have another practice that does not at all connect to this perception. So there is some kind of, you know, what I call it, you know, schizophrenic, you know, way of thinking about politics. And therefore, because none of us gave full legitimacy to the political process in the region, we started developing our own utopian imagination about what things should look like. And that led to major two trends that emerged in the region. One of them is pan-Arab nationalist, which imagined the Arab world as one particular entity, unified politically, culturally, religiously, and therefore we should strive and struggle to unify the Arab world and unite the Ummah in one particular political boundaries. And that was, of course, a trend that was too old and ancient in our culture. It started as a response to the the Turkish nationalism, but eventually it ended as, again, a major political trend through the Nasserites and later on through the Ba'ath parties and so on and so forth. So this is one major component of our psychology, political psychology in the region. The second major component of our political psychology in the region is called political Islam. And again, political Islam, like pro-Arab nationalism, emerged as well after the collapse of the Ottoman Empire especially in 1927 when Muslim Brotherhood were born in Egypt and Hassan al-Banna started to say that, which is, by the way, the exact narrative of pro-Arab nationalism, but is depending on other ontological and philosophical foundations. When Hassan al-Banna declared that at this stage, no one is the custodian of Muslims and Islam as a ummah because the Khalifa has gone and there is nothing called Khilafa. And our mind politically for 1,300 years, it means until then, was in fact programmed to follow a concept of something called one Khalifa who is representing our interest as a ummah. So the idea that there is nothing called Khalifa was not easy to be accepted and to be comprehended by us in the region. And therefore, by the way, since the collapse of the Ottoman Empire in 1924 and afterwards, you know how many people declare themselves Khalifas? Al-Sharif -al Hussein ibn Ali in Mecca, he said that I would like to become the Khalifa because I am the custodian of the Holy Mosque and I am from the offspring of the Prophet. And therefore, he did declare himself as a Khalifa. Of course, he was not accepted. Even the king of Egypt at that stage was preparing for a conference to bring people in order to also announce him as a Khalifa. Uh, Sultan, uh, I mean, at that time he was a Sultan, but of course he is the, became a king, uh, Abdul Aziz, of course, in Saudi Arabia. He had another notion about what Khilafah should become, uh, should, should be uh, like. So therefore, our political mind immediately was trying to compensate the absence of the Khalifa with another Khalifa. Of course, that didn't work. <laughs> For many reasons, one of them, the British and the French, had their own plans. And you know that most of the above-mentioned leaders were, in a way or another, under the protection of the British. Uh, and therefore, the British, although they hinted to them in 1916, 1917, 1918, that they would support a creation of something called the Arab state or the Khalifa, by the way, these two notions were sold by the British officials to our leaders at that stage. This is just to tell you how deep the conflict that we see right now in Egypt is. They, we were convinced, but if you give up the Ottomans, you will be given two things. The Khalifa, Khilafa, which should go back to the Arabs instead of the Turks. And second, as well, you will have the chance to establish your own dream of national state or national Khilafa. And that did not work, as you may know. Sultan I mean, Sharif Hussein Ali ended in exile until he died in 1930 in Cyprus. And uh, Abdul Aziz became a king in Saudi Arabia, acknowledged by the British. And of course, later on, uh, Farouk, he did not do anything beside that he lost his, his, his uh, power to Jamal Abdel Nasser and the new circle of pro-Arab nationalism emerged in Egypt. So eventually, the two dreams did not actually materialize into something solid. However, 
we have created within the two trends of thought, the pro-Arab nationalism and the Islamic political Islam, proper idealistic notion about how politics should look like. And we continued demanding our current fragmented, weak, and fragile states to adopt something grand that can never be achieved by the limitations of powers and resources. So, therefore, most of the Arab states did not have legitimacy in the collective mind of the people. It means when we compare what these states are capable of delivering and the low profile politics and imagination that a small, tiny territorial entity has with the grand notion of you being the, dissident, the, the, the inheritant of a great civilization and culture, of course, you are going to accuse this state always of being uh, you know, something that is alien to your culture, something that is not legitimate, and again, it is nothing but a puppet for the Western forces and the Western powers in the region, which was true. These states were puppets for the Western powers in the region, and none of them had its own motivation to create its own dominance and its own paradigm of thinking, because a fragmentation can never allow them to do so. So, since then, state, in order to control, it has to depend on others rather than the locals. So this is why the whole issue of our states being enslaved by Western powers was a political necessity in order to subjugate the, the citizens of the nation who have never acknowledged the state as legitimate. So democracy did not actually materialize in most of the Arab states. Uh, the proper representation of thoughts and ideas did not, including in countries where some people have really, like Jamal Abdel Nasser, for example, in Egypt, he did establish a state based on pro-Arab nationalism, and he was a leader of, of, of nationalism in one another. But politically, he had to deal with the constraints of politics. So he cannot really establish the dream that he has inherited. He had to deal with the realism of politics as it was actually dictated upon him because of the limitations in the region. And everyone else, the same. Saudi Arabia did the same, and many other people did the same. So again, we had a lot of disappointments about the state. And we had a lot of disappointments about the, less, the West who is supporting the state. And in our mind, for 100 years, we, have, we did maybe equate foreign intervention with the local puppets in our region. So the foreign intervention was necessary to protect the puppets, based on our popular mind, and the puppets were actually nothing but agents for the West. And this combination was a fatal combination. We were very angry about the West, and we were very angry about our governments. We were angry about the same thing, which is that we are alien to what's supposed to be ours. We feel that our politics is hijacked. Our future is hijacked. Our reality is hijacked. We are not represented there in politics, and we are not represented in interest of the state. That continued to be with us for generations. It was deepened very much by the occupation of Palestine. From 1948, a great insult to the Arab world occurred when Arab armies invaded you know, the territories of Palestine in order to defend and to liberate what was at that time regarded as an Arab country, I mean, Arab territories after the 1947 decision of the, of the General Assembly uh, of separation between the Palestinian and, and Israeli uh, or between an Arab and the Jewish state. The Arabs sent their armies and they were defeated and they were, we had gone through a huge, deep insult. The insult of 1948 created an earthquake that demolished, actually, what was left of legitimacy for the so-called rulers and governors of the Arab world. It, it was immediately, almost after that, that we have revolutions and the rise of pro-Arab nationalism as a solution to retrieve 
our dignity from the insult that we have been facing in 1948. So Jamal Abdel Nasser came, and you know, in, in Iraq and in Jordan and in Syria, we had a lot of uprisings, a lot of revolutions in order to create a new progressive, pro-Arab nationalist kind of you know regimes that could liberate what was lost from us in 1948. So from 1948 to 1967, we had that kind of pro-Arab nationalism emerging in the region because of Palestine. But in 1967, the pro-Arab nationalist project was defeated again by the Israelis because we could not defend what was left of Palestine in 1967. And the forces of Jamal Abdel Nasser and the Syrians and the Jordanians were again defeated. And again, another disappointment amongst the public and the masses created very deep insult and disappointment of what was then regarded as the only hope for us to reclaim our dignity. From 1967, a new trend was trying to pick up, which is the Islamic one. So the Islamists at that time were still in jail during Jamal Abdel Nasser time, and many other parts of the Arab world were still dominated either by pro-Arab nationalists or leftists. But the Islamists started picking up on the defeat of 1967 and introducing another narrative, saying that we will be con losing every battle as long as we are not in line of Islam and in line of our own tradition and culture and our own authentic uh, belonging. So this notion started to spread amongst the masses and steadily since then, Islamists became dominant amongst the, the uh, uh, people and the public, especially in, in areas where people are really disappointed about what has been achieved at that. Of course, that by the end of the 70s, during the 80s, became much more prominent than the 60s. And in the 80s and the 90s, we saw a rise of the Islamic movement in most of the Arab countries. And in every election that was held in 1990s, with a little bit of freedom, not necessarily a major one, you will find that Islamists, like in Jordan 1989, they won as the major bloc in the Parliament of Jordan. In Yemen, they became the major bloc. Even in Egypt, we had some kind of elections, also Islamists, where the indicate, indications used to show Islamists and the front. In Tunisia in 1989, as you remember, when there was elections and Nahda Barti won by a huge majority, and Zayn al-Abidin had to actually forge the elections, and the movement has to go back uh, out to, to, to an exile, and so on. So that was a very critical period. Islamists were not given the same chance like pro-Arab nationalists to lead and to establish governments. Because most of the governments led by pro-Arab nationalists, Ba'ath or Jamal Abdel Nasser and others, were a result of military intervention. It means military coups. And the, these kind of governments could not deliver again, as I said, on the major issue of Palestine and many other issues related to uh, the situation. Although maybe the power that they were able actually to reclaim was because of the Cold, Cold War at that stage. Because the Cold War enabled them a space to operate between the West and the East. So once you are upset with the West, you go to the East, you get weapons. Once you are upset with the East, you go to the West, you get weapons. So therefore, there was an area. In 1989, this area shrank. There is nothing called the Cold War. There is only one power dominant, which is called the American one. And on the other side, you have the Islamists rising in the region. And there is no way of maneuvering. Either you are with me or you are against me. And this is exactly the formula that led to Al-Qaeda, which said we are against you. And then the, the attack against uh, 11 September that led to the great polarization between the so-called American forces and the so-called extreme version of understanding uh, the Islamic uh, belonging. So that was a major battle that we have gone through in the region. Again, political Islam was never given the opportunity actually to rule. Until maybe recently, this is about the Arab world in particular. Of course, maybe in Turkey we have another story, but in the Arab world, it was only two years ago when the Arab Spring, in a way, took place. And people went for elections, and it was no surprise for any one of us to see that Islamists actually are dominating every kind of election all over the Arab world. And that most likely the scenario that might happen in any other country, even the countries that did not experience Arab uh, spring. That is a natural progress of history, and this is a normal procedure within the narrative of our culture and civilization in the region. Islamists were confronted now with reality. Islamists had two important assets. 
The first one is imagination about the future, the present, and the past. So they do represent for the public the continuity of authenticity. You know, and therefore, f they are not alien. They have never been inserted in the region. They have never been created by foreign powers. They are natural, part of the fabric of the society. So authenticity is a very important asset for Muslim, Muslim movements or Islamic movements. And the second one, they have very big popularity. They have a huge popularity amongst the public as a result of them being representing the ideal that the Arab world and the Muslims were trying to achieve in the Arab world. Beside that, they don't have the experience because they have never been really allowed to rule. They have been in politics as opposition most of the time. They did participate occasionally in some parliaments, in some governments, but always as a marginal minority of rulers rather than people who have the decision and the say. They have been cosmetically you know, included in governments in Jordan, in Egypt, in, 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 or in political systems in Yemen and so on, but not really as rulers, as people who could be given some legitimacy to the regime which was at core either secular or pan-Arab nationalist or even a pragmatist. So that basically was the situation. The first elections in Egypt brought a president, the first you know, presidential elections, and uh, Mohammed Morsi came from Muslim Brotherhood. Not only that, he was a leader of Muslim Brotherhood. So now you are confronting a new reality. It is not anymore that you are in opposition or you are complementary to others. You are, in fact, someone who is leading. That was taken as a surprise for a lot of people because actually the West at this stage was not really clear about whether to allow a country like Egypt, with the weight of Egypt, to drift into something called Islamic fundamentalism, or you know, you read later to interfere. Especially that Egypt is bordering another state which is very important and central to the strategic thought of the West called Israel. So, what are you going to do with that? Okay, the West did not take very quick action about it or a decision. Why? Because the West, here I mean, I mean the United States of America and the European Union, are going through huge crises, economic crises, and political crises, and international shift. So there was a window of opportunity where Muslim Brotherhood could really go through it and govern, simply because the Western power within our countries is at its minimum. The weakness of the American presence and the withdrawal of the Americans from Iraq and Afghanistan and the withdrawal from the Americans of the Americans from even politically in the region and the rise of China and Russia in a moment of time and the, you know, economic crisis that hit hard at the core of, of, the, of capitalism did create priorities rather than dominating the Middle East. So we were able in the region to develop our own mechanisms and to choose freely rather than, own, rather than being only a representative of the Western interest. And this is why Muslim Brotherhood did succeed in Tunisia and they did succeed in Egypt in being elected from the first instant. Because otherwise it would have been impossible to, if the Western hand was so forceful in the region, it was impossible to allow some kind of elections like that to take place. Anyway, this is what happened, and now Muslim Brotherhood are, are having a president. They have a president, but they don't have the government. It, I mean, they don't have the power. They don't have the army. They don't have the intelligence. They don't have the judiciary. And they don't have most of the other elements of, that could really make the state. Why? Because simply for the last few decades, the so-called state in Egypt was in a way or another shaped in order to suit particular interest of the governing party in Egypt, which was al Hizb al-Watani or the National Party of Hisni Mubarak and before him Sadat and before him Jamal Abdel Nasser. So the state was in fact molded and fashioned in order to achieve narrow interest for people who have different theory of what Egypt should look like. Now, you are coming to be a president in a state where almost everyone in it is against you and thinks of you as an enemy. Why? Because since he was asked to be there, he was taught 
that the strategic enemy of the state is Muslim Brotherhood. That's true. The judiciary used to put Muslim Brotherhood in jails. The military used to speak about Muslim Brotherhood as the enemies of the state. The intelligence used to regard Muslim Brotherhood as enemies of the state. And therefore, you are in front of people, your colleagues who are working with you and who are leading the state, basically, for you, regard you as a threat. Therefore, there is very deep crisis, much more deeper than what you could imagine, about the fact that the state is not easily going to give up for the sake of accepting result of democracy. Because the result of democracy in this stage is going to be contrary to the collective memory of a state as it was built by previous regimes and previous circles of interest and or, you know, organizations. Now, we have reached a point of polarization. Why? Because simply, I see the following. On one hand, I have an opposition that have chosen to commit the sin of alliance with what we call the Fulul, who are the remnants of the old regime, and trying to bring down the elected president from power. And on the other hand, we have a president supported by Islamists, which was, by the way, not very comfortable to have, because you don't like, as a president, to be only supported by a political group which has one color. And unfortunately, this is also the situation because Muslims, Islamists mean, and, and Salafis are unified in one particular bloc supporting the president of Egypt, and the others are forming their own political blocks against him in alliance with remnants of the old regime. So we have a polarization. This polarization thinks of itself or the relationship of each other as zero-sum game, either me or you. And that's very dangerous. We don't like that to happen. It is true that Muslim Brotherhood at this stage have much more popularity in the, than the leftists and secularists and the remnants of the old regime. And this is why they were capable of having at least two million people marching in the streets of Cairo against not more than 100 or 200,000 people for the opposition a few, last week. But that does not mean when a country is going through transformation, that does not mean that the numerical popularity is the only way of measuring the legitimacy. Because you need to build consensus in one another, or at least you need to build some kind of proper understanding amongst the political components of the society. But what I have seen there is an opposition that thinks of Muslim Brotherhood that should be out of politics. And that's a major problem, by the way. The, our opposition, which has, as I said, come from, unfortunately, elite that was for generations dissociated from the public. This elite dissociated from the public within so-called secular and leftist organizations and political groups did not accept in a principle that the so-called Islamists could be equal to them as far as the political process is concerned. So that created a huge rift in the society. They accepted the result of the elections as it came, but later on, when they were able to reorganize themselves and to reconnect, actually, with the, with the remnants, they started another campaign, which, in my opinion, did go very far above what political rivalry or competition should be lo like. And on the other hand, you have Islamists who have Muslim Brotherhood in alliance with Salafis. And we have heard, you know, slogans in, a, in, in, in Cairo during the last week, which were actually very dangerous again, because you will have some kind of religious slogan, slogans used in a political battle. And the religious slogans will speak about haq and batil, speak about black and white, speak about, you know, uh, infidels and, and believers, which is not what politics is all about. So this polarization should end. Unfortunately, we could not find people in between, political groups in between to mediate, because suddenly we only saw a gap in between, and we saw the white and the black. And that was not something that we would like to actually go through. The elections or the referendum will take place on Saturday, and most likely if the referendum takes place on Saturday, that the constitution will pass, but we will 
continue to see a fragmented society as far as politics is concerned. What is needed now for, for, from both parties is to acknowledge each other. And not to acknowledge each other by giving you know, acceptance to each other only, but by actually accepting, accepting the compromise. Neither Islamists can create their own ideal that they have inherited for the last few decades about what Islamic State should look like or what our ideal Islamic society should look like, nor the secularists and the pan-Arab nationalists can achieve also what has been there for a few decades, because simply that did not work. So they should accept that there is a will of the public in order to create change, and those who come as a result of change should accept that they cannot create a society based on their own imagination. They need really to compromise in order to establish, stabilize the society. This is how I see the Egyptian society moving in the future. Over the next few years, I am optimistic. I don't feel that we are going to head towards civil war. There are many elements within our society that prevent us going deep into you know, confrontation and violence that might lead into complete absence. Major one of them is the youth. And I will end by talking, because it is a positive story, so I, will, I left it for the last few minutes of my speech, the youth. The elite in the Arab world has been created and formed as a result of polarization from the beginning, of two narratives from the beginning, of imagination about idealism and the crude reality of realism from the beginning. So you have an elite dissociated from the public, ruling based on interest of the public, of the interest of the, of the, of the foreign, and also their own personal interest, and you have masses that have their own imagination. That polarization did exist. In fact, during the revolution of Egypt and Tunisia, we have found that there is a new elite in the Arab world emerging. Smart youth equipped with telecommunications and with internet, capable of developing paradigms of thinking that are not ideological by nature, but they are value-centered. So instead of me being Islamist and you are secularist and he is leftist and he is this and that, suddenly we found ourselves sitting in Tahrir Square defending freedom, social justice, democracy, transparency. Fantastic story. Suddenly, the colors of ideology and the colors of partisan division and utopian thinking about Islam or the realistic thinking about you know, uh, politics have merged together into one magnificent theater. And this theater has figures who are new, actors who have never been there, people we have never been disappointed about them because they have never been given the opportunity. So new faces, new discourse, new culture emerge in the region. So we actually went through great enthusiasm and excitement. For the first time, I see youth who I have never seen before on any TV screen or anywhere in a newspaper standing in front of me delivering fantastic speech about the future and the present without any kind of you know, inferiority or even a feeling of, of, of necessities that have been dominant within our political elite. But also it was realistic that it could be achieved because they are a result of a generation of communication. So they are not utopian only. They are also realistic. So it was fantastic. And we thought that this generation will take us eventually from the chains of the past into the future, which was brilliant and magnificent. But unfortunately, what has happened, the traditional classical movements and political groups and forces from all parties started again reclaiming the territories that were occupied by the youth. And suddenly, they came back to the stage. And our youth, again, instead of them continuing to be an you know, to be the representatives of our collective, you know, hope of the future, they also found trenches in order to go in. And suddenly you find Islamists going back to the Islamic camp, leftists going to back to the leftist camp, and secularists going to secular camps, and becoming, in a way or another, part of the old. So the beautiful new that was created for a few months at the beginning of the revolution, found itself, in a way or another, in the trenches of the past and the old. And this is why we lost, for now, that kind of opportunity. 
if we now develop new culture within our youth of reorganizing our forces and reorganizing our imagination in a manner that could build on the beautiful experience of the revolution as it started, we have a great hope of passing to the future. But if we continue to go back to the past and to sit in the trenches of the past and to shoot at others, as we are doing right now in Egypt, it means we have lost these youth to the old machine of rivalry and competition, which has succeeded in failure for the last few decades. decades. So this is why I always appeal to the youth, this is not your place. This fight is not your fight. This is a fight between the new and the past. You should be standing in the new front. You should not be going back to the past. And we should continue to create the balance that we need in our societies, rather than to again mobilize ourselves to defend old ideas and thoughts and traditions that failed during the last few decades and maybe for the one century. We have a chance. We did not lose hope yet. We will continue to struggle in order to go through this window of opportunity. And I am sure at the end it might take some time, but we will be victorious and we will establish our democratic, stable society as we feel that it should be established to preserve our interest of that particular part of the region rather than the West or the East. Thank you very much. Um, wow, thank you very much for that uh, overview of over 100 years of uh, history. And I'm sure that uh, our audience has a few questions. Uh, please go ahead. Thank you so much for the fascinating talk, really. Uh, just, uh, I just have one thing to add uh, from the Turkish perspective. We have a similar story in Turkey, but with a few differences. In Turkey, the state has always been more legitimate because it was not a colonial creation, but a continuation of the Ottoman Empire. Maybe that helped us to some extent. And even the Islamists of Turkey criticized the nature of the regime, but not the state itself. And we had a similar confrontation between the Islamists and the old regime, if you will, in Turkey in late 90s. And there was Arbakan, as you know, as leader of the Islamists. But Erbakan could not succeed. I hope Mursi will succeed today in moving forward. But then Erdogan succeeded five years later again, precisely because he was able to reach out to a broader population other than his own Islamic you know, base or Islamist base. So I think one key will be how far-reaching the Ikhwan will be in securing the trust of other camps in society. I know it's hard, and in Turkey it was hard too, but if there's one lesson from Turkish experience which can help the Islamists in Egypt or Tunisia, I think that, that experience might be helpful. Just I wanted to edit that, but thank you so much really for the fascinating talk.